So, um, as I said, I've got Randy here, and he's the Director of Infrastructure for Salvation Army's Western Territory, and we'll talk about a little bit more about what that means in just a moment. But um, before we get into that, there's a few things that I want to go through with you. So we're going to cover a bunch of different topics today. We're going to start with the introduction, which is what we're doing now. Um, we're going to go into a little bit about the technology architecture of Cisco Meraki, kind of what Cisco Meraki Cloud Managed IT is, how it works, what the value is, um, what cloud management actually means in the context of Meraki products, because a lot of different solutions refer to themselves as cloud or cloud managed or cloud enabled or pick your industry buzzword that you particularly like. But there's a difference, um, I think, in a lot of ways in what Cisco Meraki does. So I want to make sure that we kind of highlight that and, and clarify what exactly that looks like. And then we'll talk about the Salvation Army. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Salvation Army, so we won't spend a ton of time on kind of what they are, what they do. But we will cover that in, in brief just for anyone who's not familiar. And then sort of what the network challenges are, um, some of the things that Randy and his team use technology to accomplish and how Meraki has helped them to do that as they've made the transition into cloud managed networking. Then we'll do a demo. So Randy has been kind enough to offer, uh, to let us demo in Salvation Army's actual dashboard organization, which is pretty exciting. So we'll take a look at an actual site or a couple of sites and see kind of what this looks like in practice for them. And then finally, we'll talk about the product families, kind of the different products in the Cisco Meraki portfolio, and then we'll go into Q&A. So, there are a lot of you here on the line. This is actually one of the best attended webinars that I've ever done. So I'm thrilled to have you all. Just be aware, as you ask questions throughout the session, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A panel as we go through the webinar. Um, don't feel the need to hold them for the end. But it's very likely we will not be able to answer all of them. I've got Deanna here, also from our marketing team, who's going to be trying to help go through and do Q&A. But again, there are so many of you and only a couple of us. So we'll see what we can do. We will have some dedicated time at the end for Q&A, so if you have questions that have not been answered, we will try to get to some of those at the end that we think you know, would be good for everyone to hear the answer to. Um, you are potentially eligible for a free access point for attending this webinar. You guys are lucky you got in that right after this transition. We used to use our 8.11 n uh, APs, our entry-level APs, but we've now transitioned the entry level of our portfolio into the new MR33, which is actually an AC access point. So the MR33 is now the AP that you can get for attending this webinar if you have not received a free Meraki webinar AP before, and if you are an IT professional, there are some terms and conditions there. If you want to know the details of that, go to meraki.cisco.com slash free AP. Comes with a full three-year cloud management license, comes with all the features and functionality. It's a great way to kind of get some hands-on experience with Cisco Meraki Wireless. In order to do that, you're going to need to confirm your shipping info. We want to make sure we're sending these APs to the right place. So after this webinar, if you're interested in pursuing that free AP offer, please go to your webinar reminder email that you received before this webinar, and you should be able to see the contact info for your Meraki rep. Just reach out to them, just shoot them an email, give them a call, uh, make sure that they have your current shipping info, and they can get that set up for you and get that AP out to you. So with that, with the logistics kind of out of the way, um, let's talk a little bit about the technology architecture and kind of what Cisco Meraki technology looks like, what our cloud management looks like. The first thing to understand is every single thing Cisco Meraki does is cloud managed. So there's six product lines, wireless, switching, our security platform, which is also our SD-WAN platform, uh, IP telephony, mobility management, what's often called the MDM or EMM, right, endpoint management, and security cameras security cameras being the newest product. So we've continued to kind of create new technologies under this cloud management umbrella. And what's unique about these is there's no command line, there's no local manager, it's all done through the cloud. So the devices have a kind of encrypted tunnel back over the internet to the Meraki cloud, and that's where you do all of your management, monitoring, configuration, everything. And we'll talk about what that looks like. You'll see some of this in the demo. But the idea is the device is talking to the cloud and it's doing two things, it's downloading things like configuration, firmware, right, downloading data that it needs to operate properly, and uploading what's called metadata about what's happening in the network, who's connected, what kind of devices, how much traffic they're passing, what applications they're using, log data, things like that, so that we can display that to you in our cloud management dashboard from a reporting, analytics, logging, and visibility perspective. And we've seen this kind of take off in the last several years. It's been really exciting to watch uh, the adoption of this cloud management technology. People are really excited about it. We've seen it uh, growing enormously in the U.S. and Canada. 
in Western Europe, now more even in Eastern Europe as well, um, in parts of Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia. Like we're seeing this kind of take off all over the place, which is very, very exciting for us because it means we're doing something right. right? People want this technology. They want to solve the problems that we're trying to solve, and that's a great thing to see. So what does that management actually look like? I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. I just want to give everyone a basic understanding of kind of the mechanics of cloud management um, so that you understand how this works. Like I said, there's a, a encrypted tunnel, an encrypted communications line between the device and the cloud just over the internet. So if you have a Meraki AP, Meraki firewall, Meraki switch, security camera, whatever it may be, as soon as you power it up and give it internet access, right, give it network connectivity, it's going to call home to dashboard to the cloud, identify itself, that, over that tunnel, it's going to download its config, potentially download a, the newer firmware if there's a new stable firmware available that's not the one that shipped with it, uh, and it's going to, you know, implement whatever config you've given it in the cloud and just be up and running and go from that point. So from a staging and deployment perspective, it makes things really easy. Once it's online and operating, it's going to be sending up that metadata. So that's where all the visibility and kind of metrics that we show in the cloud come from. Um, a couple important things to understand here. One is what happens if you lose cloud connectivity. So a lot of people say, okay, well, if it needs internet access for, you know, configuration, what happens if you lose internet? Well, the device is going to keep operating on the same config that it had. So it's going to keep running on that known good config. And basically, you just won't be able to make, mostly won't be able to make changes to the config until you get internet back. It's, there are a couple minor exceptions to that. We basically want to make sure you have enough access locally to fix any problems that might be causing issues with connecting to the internet or connecting to the cloud. But beyond that, most of the configuration is only available in dashboard. So the answer is, you know, it'll keep, operating, keep doing what it's supposed to do. You just won't be able to change the config in, in most ways until you're reconnected to dashboard to the cloud. The second thing is that user traffic does not go through the cloud. So when I say metadata is passed up to the cloud, that's, you know, analytics data that we're gathering on the box and shipping up. The actual user traffic of, you know, going to Google.com or pulling a file from a local file server, none of that goes through the cloud only the monitoring and management, the command and control traffic. So your user kind of data, your user traffic is all packed locally or to the internet or however it would be passed on any other network. If you, if you want to know more about things like data center reliability, you know, what's our cloud architecture look like? What are our certifications around PCI, SC16, HIPAA, things like that? You can feel free to take a look at meraki.cisco.com slash trust, which has a lot of that information for you. The other thing that's good to know about this is that management traffic is incredibly lightweight. There's very little actual bandwidth consumed for that management tunnel, so it's not going to eat up a bunch of your bandwidth. So with that, let's um, do a quick intro, intro to our guest today, um, Randy, again, from the Salvation Army. So Randy, if you could do, I, I know it's, it feels kind of silly because I think everyone, at least I feel like everyone knows what the Salvation Army does, but if you could just give us a quick intro to kind of you know, the organization, your mission, and, and your position within the organization. That'd be great. You bet, no problem. So the Salvation Army is 150 years old now, and um, it was founded uh, back in 1865 in London, England. And basically, uh, to basically meet the meet, uh, meet human needs in uh, in in God's name uh, throughout the world. We're in about 135 countries now. Um, my region is uh, focused on the western region of the United States. There are four regions in the United States. So I cover basically the Rocky Mountains out uh, to Hawaii, Alaska, and Micronesia. So that's my region. Um, within that region, we have about 600 uh, connected network sites that we maintain and monitor. And uh, within those, there's varying levels of sophistication um, from call centers down to just service centers with one person at them. Um, I've been doing this job, uh, I've been in this position since about 2006, and at that time I came on board basically to consolidate, uh, within each region there are about 10 divisions, every region has about 10 divisions, to consolidate all those divisions. And at the time it was a very disparate uh, amount of network connectivity, a lot of Cisco, but we had, uh, uh, we had Xilan, we had HP, uh, we had some Foundry out there, and so homogenizing all that took uh, quite a few years uh, from 2006 to today. And basically, it was all standardized on Cisco, traditional 800, uh, 2900, 2800 type uh, series appliances and ASAs, for example. Um, but that in itself was quite a challenge um, because each of these regions, the data at the time was all over the place. We had data on the local 
uh, remote sites. We had data at the uh, divisional offices and data at the regional offices. And depending on what your your function was, you had to have access to all of that. So it was it was a very complex hub and spoke type of network. Um, and so it was kind of a challenge to get that to be operational and manageable because I only have six staff network staff. Um, and that's a lot of a network. We have over 3,000 pieces of a network of gear out there. And so that keeps everyone pretty darn busy. Um, so anyway, um, that's basically an overview of the, the organization and my job and how, um, how, how we've been trying to uh, adapt to all of this uh, changing uh, architecture and network and, and demands over the years. And then when Meraki came along, of course, uh, a few years ago, um, I was at an uh, executive business uh, council back uh, in San Jose a few years back, and, and I'd heard about Meraki before in their wireless uh, venue. Um, and at the time, I wasn't willing to uh, dump uh, the traditional Cisco wireless for Meraki. Uh, so, you know, we looked at it, we explored a little bit and said, you know, well, we've made quite a bit of investment in the traditional wireless. Uh, but uh, some ties of uh, change hit us and we, we decided to, to move to a different direction before we hit the Meraki platform at the time. And now, uh, basically, we're moving full steam ahead with the Meraki Cloud Managed Applications to all of those sites. But deploying 600 sites, obviously, is, uh, is kind of a daunting task, um, if not a financially uh, large task for a, a nonprofit organization that basically um, is, has a very, very tight budget constraint. Great. Okay. So thanks, thanks for all that background. Um, I wanted to highlight, so you touched on some of this, but you, you mentioned, you know, you don't necessarily have a lot of staff on site. You had data kind of all over the place. Um, were there any other kind of major challenges? It, it sounded like when we talked before, there were some issues with generally reliability and kind of visibility. Um, can you speak to that a little bit in terms of some of those challenges you were facing in the, the pre-Meraki network architecture? Well, reliability-wise, um, whenever a site would go down, um, it, it generally required us to ship a new piece of equipment out to the site and ship some smart hands out to that site. And as, uh, as in, you, in your demonstration, when you show the geographic diversity of our uh, organization, when you're trying to walk somebody through uh, setting up a, you know, a Cisco uh, 891 out in Wrangell, Alaska, um, it's, it's kind of hard to get smart enough hands to really touch that thing. And if you're walking them through the command line code with their little blue cable and their serial port, if they even have one, that can be quite the challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, at one point with the, um, with the Cisco architecture early on, this is probably five years before we hit the Meraki roadmap, is uh, we tried something called Dynamic Multipoint Virtual Network, DMVPN. And it sounded like a really great tool because it would basically build your network for you to based on need. And uh, we tried to roll that out. We spent almost two years trying to roll that out, and it was a catastrophic failure, simply because um, when our network grew to 600 nodes, the routing tables on each of the small appliances absolutely blew the machines up. And we couldn't afford to put ISRs in every little small office. Uh, so we had, to, we, had to, we had to backtrack and basically hand build every connection on every router in our entire organization. And we've maintained that up until Meraki came along. Um, and so that was a, that was a giant uh, task to keep that maintained and uh, keep that working all the time. And when things would go wrong, trying to find the point at which that failure occurred was always challenging. Got it. Um, so I loved, so one of the, one of my favorite things about kind of the, the Salvation Army IT history or what you guys have been doing is this concept of these router parties. So can you unpack that a little for us and, and kind of explain to the attendees, you know, what these router parties, like what, was, what was this operation that you had going? Because I thought it was really interesting and I'm sure they will too. Right. Well, um, if you had to rule out and do, for example, we had to update the iOS and a bunch of routers. Well, we can't just update it on site. Generally, we have to configure new appliances, new routers, um, load all the new iOS, set all the configurations, make sure we have the accurate configuration for each of those sites. We do 50 to 70 at a time um, in the 600 or so that we have, maybe more than that. Um, and so what we do is we get our staff together in some city. It might be Phoenix, it might be Portland, it might be San Francisco. And we have 50 to 70 uh, routers uh, uh, shipped to that site. Uh, we get our staff together for two or three days, and they basically go through those, inventory them, power them up, make sure they worked, <clears throat> go through the burn-in, 
make sure the iOS was uh, uploaded and, and set correctly, um, load the config, label it, and we have, they used to put all these colored dots on the routers to tell what phase of the process they were in. It was, it was very organized, and the network manager I had at the time, you know, he was, he was very good at that. And, um, and, but we would stay there for three days, and I remember at one party, we were at, I think, a, they were at a, a Marriott residence someplace, and we had a little conference room reserved uh, in the residence, and about 2.30 in the morning, uh, the cleaning staff kicked us out and said, hey, we have to clean, you gotta get out of here. So we had to go to bed, obviously. Um, they were, you know, bent on getting the thing done so they could get out of there, but, you know, it was, it was quite the process to, to reconfigure and load all those new images. Um, on the, that equipment. And we did that probably in 10 years, three times to 600 devices. Um, and it just became, uh, you know, be kind of a staple of our life. We knew we had to do this every three years and it would take a good six to eight months to do it each time. And so that's quite the commitment um, and quite the task for, for an organization of my size. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. It sounds like a really kind of creative um, way of addressing that problem, but it unfortunately doesn't sound like it was all that efficient because you have to fly everybody out, you have to spend all that right. time, and you, you know, it just it sounds very cumbersome, even though I personally think it's kind of a cool way to solve that problem. Your um, picture on this uh, on this slideshow here with, uh, it's hard to see because it's so small on the, web, uh, the WebEx, but basically those are all sheets of all these sites, and you can see that there's green lines to the ones that are completed to a certain uh, degree uh, I mean, it was just, it was quite, quite complicated. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Um, so what did that kind of transition look like? So that was, you know, day negative one, if you will. That was the pre-Meraki architecture. Um, what was the kind of decision process that led you to Meraki? And then especially what was the deployment experience like in terms of rolling out the Meraki architecture? Well, the initial rollout, uh, really, we, we, did, we couple, did a couple of pilots uh, that were about six to eight months long, um, where we rolled out uh, several of our divisional offices uh, and several small sites to see how the technology pretty much scaled and how it operated and to kind of get our feet wet. Uh, there, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that there was a lot of resistance in our network uh, staff to switch from the, you know, basically the command line um, uh, entry into into uh, programming your routers to the uh, cloud-based GUI type uh, interface. There was quite a bit of resistance until we hit this one breaking point where basically um, the granularity of the visibility you have with the Meraki security appliances is so far beyond what we had with any traditional Cisco uh, equipment. It just it made the the task so much easier. And at some point, it was my the, a turning point. I would say we were probably 14 months into the process where it wasn't me pushing this technology on the network team saying, hey, we need to move in this direction. It was actually the network team saying, we need to get Meraki everywhere. We just can't manage this anymore. I mean, it was, it was obvious. Um, and so a after that point, basically, we did, we did an initial rollout where we put uh, security appliances in our two main data centers and our 10 regions. So that was the first push, get the, get, the, get the data centers and the divisional offices up to date so that all of their satellite offices that needed connectivity, we could just plug them in and they'd be able to connect into there and get the resources they needed. So that was, that was a good 14 to 16 month process. After that, it basically was a finance problem. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We've rolled out as much as we can as we've been financially able to. Uh, we're still working with uh, Cisco sales to hopefully roll out the rest of our uh, environment, hopefully within the next 12 months. That's my hope. Um, but uh, once the network team said, you know, we just can't manage the traditional iOS when we have to, for example, I, I get re reports all the time of um, illegal activity. Uh, ISPs are getting much better at identifying who is, who is uh, the source of BitTorrent activity or whatnot. And right now, all we can do is you know, basically uh, blacklist MAC addresses that we see coming through there with the traditional iOS. But with Meraki security appliances, which you may touch on at one point, um, you have layer seven filtering where we can actually turn off certain types of traffic. BitTorrent is one of the biggest, of course, that we're hit with. Uh, and, um, and we have some ISPs that are getting so sophisticated now that the ISPs are actually doing proactive 
um, vulnerability testing, and we're getting we're getting reports one or two a week that our traditional Cisco equipment is is vulnerable to uh, like NTP uh, attacks of some sort. Um, and so we have to remediate those. And the only way we can do it is stick Meraki out there. Or we could go through a long, prolonged, do another router party, gather all the devices in there, and do a massive iOS upgrade again uh, to take care of that. But we really don't want to do that. It's really right. painful. So, so it sounds like it's it's not necessarily a technological or security issue on the on the uh, you know iOS side so much as just the the operational issue of making sure that those devices are up to date is preventing you from, from having the effective security that you need. At least that's what it that, sounds like. That's correct, that is correct. Yeah. Um, okay, well that's that's very interesting. That's super, again, helpful background. Um, so you touched on things like blocking BitTorrent, um, some of the visibility that, that you have into kind of what's happening on the network and, and making sure that only the things you want are happening on the network. Uh, what are some of the, the features that you've seen across all the different products that you're using? I know, feel free to throw um, the cameras uh, or the systems manager, mobility management there as well. I think you're trialing those. So what are some of the features that you've kind of had good experiences with or, or even ones that you've struggled with? Just tell us what your experience has been and what the kind of key features are to you. Yeah, I, and, and the other big, the other big I think, motivation for us to switch to, uh, to, to the Meraki platform was all of the built-in um, content filtering intrusion detection uh, that, that is basically baked in to the the device and the price of the of the uh, cloud management. Um, several years back, uh, we were a, we're a big we're, we still are a, quite a large WebSense um, shop. We've got um, an array of about ten servers, I think uh, six content servers, which uh, are basically load balanced to the back end a bunch of um, um, uh, the, 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 I'm trying to think of the uh, load balancing thing. Um, net scalers um, to to web balance, and what we had is all the routers had the UR filtering um, hook into them, so that our content filtering was basically redirected down to the WebSense cluster to verify whether it was a, a an allowed or not unallowed site to go to. Um, but at a certain point, uh, the, uh, the Cisco's IOS uh, ISR devices stop supporting that URL filter command. And so that left us kind of an alert as to how are we going to filter uh, all of these new sites we're rolling out with new devices. Um, and just as, as a point, I mean, managing that WebSense cluster is, you know, basically a job all in and to itself. It's, it's a massive undertaking. It took us years to perfect it. Um, and I'm looking forward to the day where I can turn that off now because it's still quite painful to maintain that and manage that. And we've outsourced some of the management of that because it is internal. Um, we do host that internally in our own data center. Um, but with, with the Meraki uh, devices, that content filtering and the intrusion detection has just been phenomenal. And so I've really enjoyed that. Um, as far as the layer seven filtering and the bandwidth throttling, I mean, early on in some of the testing uh, in our lab, uh, one of my favorite stories is when I was uh, experimenting with one of the devices is I, uh, I throttled back, uh, I think, Pandora and Hulu and some of those other uh, type of streaming media sites um, in my own home because basically my family is my guinea pigs. And my daughter was doing her homework in my office one day because she likes to come in there because it's quiet. And she was just really frustrated. She says, why does my music just keep buffering? And then it plays for like 10 seconds and it just buffers. And I said, huh, maybe you should just do your homework um, instead of listening to music and watching Hulu videos or whatever that was. Um, and so that was, that was pretty much... Uh, a selling point for me that we could throttle those types of bandwidth for people if they, if, you know, we're not going to completely cut off uh, things like YouTube and Netflix, but the business use of the network is probably the primary focus that we need to manage. And so making sure that people still have access to that, but it's not basically taking away all of the rest of the resources uh, of our network infrastructure and internet. Makes sense. Um, yeah, that's one of the most common things we hear, especially on the wireless and security side, is people saying, you know, the level of visibility they have over what's happening on the network and then being able to go in and kind of make changes, make policy changes right there in that same interface where they learned that, you know, maybe someone's using a bunch of bandwidth for Hulu where they can go in and just change that policy right there is, is super valuable. It's operationally efficient, right? It's easy to do. Um, what about on some of the other products? like wireless switching, again, uh, feel free to throw the cameras in there or, or whatever else 
sure if you played with? Um, on the wireless uh, uh, front, one of the things that we do is we we do provide a lot of guest access and lab access uh, to our, our populations that we serve out in the field. Um, but providing them a uh, kind of a clean, we call it a end user license agreement. So basically a splash page saying, hey, here is, um, you know, we're going to get, we're going to grant you access to our network here um, and you need to be good basically. Um, and so the integration with third-party vendors like Splash Access, which we've integrated in our wireless uh, labs, has really been beneficial and it's easy to manage. And that's been great. Uh, we had a similar system with the traditional Cisco uh, wireless um, architecture, but it was a little harder to manage. In fact, it was a lot harder to manage. Um, and so now it's, you know, everything's just basically, I, I don't need a CCIE to make all these changes, which from a management perspective for me, uh, is very beneficial. As far as the switching goes, um, we don't have a lot of switches deployed as of yet, um, but I can tell you that being able to basically do packet captures per switch port, where in the past we had to do uh, uh, install a packet capture device on that network, shadow that port, um, gather all that data to see what was going on. Now we can just do it basically from any, any console anywhere in the world, and that is just, that's better than sliced bread. For me. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit before we dive into the demo and, and show off some of those capabilities you were just talking about. Um, let's talk about kind of the future and what Salvation Army plans to do with some of this technology. So you mentioned you're you're still in the process of potentially phasing over some of your content filtering out of that WebSense cluster. You mentioned that you know there might be some more switches in your future. What else are you looking at in terms of the the future of this Meraki deployment? and new technologies or new ways to leverage the technologies you already have. Yeah, and I've, I've just been talking with our our, um, uh, our Apple support folks and using the Meraki MDM, and, um, and there are many MDMs out there. The thing that Meraki gives you is that one pane of glass for everything, and uh, my, my direct supervisor is extremely interested in just having everything in one pane of glass, as am I as well. Um, and being able to not just do, for example, the Macs and the iMacs, but also the iPads, because we do have about 500 iPads deployed that we're using um, AirWatch for right now. Um, but there is a big push that when we do that renewal that we switch over to this MDM so we can see everything in one pane of glass. Uh, and that makes it, a, you know, that's very uh, attractive from a management perspective to know where your assets are and how they're being managed. Um, so that's very important. Um, the other venue that we've just started exploring is obviously the Meraki camera uh, surveillance systems, and we have a couple of those out in demo right now, and we're actually targeting some sites that we want to explore that uh, on a consistent basis at. Um, and it makes sense for some of our smaller offices that just have one or two people and they might need two or three cameras out there. Rather than putting a full-blown surveillance system out into one of those systems, that makes so much more sense. And uh, it's, it's really nice just to be able to go to it and say, hey, okay, this small little site in Lake Havasu uh, is, uh, you know, we, we have got three cameras out here. We had an incident here. You can go to it and see it from any place, uh, any place in the dashboard that you can get to. And for anyone on the call who's not familiar with the Meraki cameras, I just want to highlight something Randy just said. What, what Randy means when he says, you know, you don't have to deploy a full-blown surveillance, architecture surveillance system is the Meraki cameras don't require what's called an NVR. Um, so you don't need uh, a video management or video storage server, basically, or, or device on site. You just need the cameras. So that's kind of the distinction that, that Randy was making where, you know, in some of the larger sites, it might be perfectly fine from an operational perspective to have all that infrastructure. But at the smaller sites, it doesn't scale to try to do that in every single site. So I just wanted to shed a little light on that for anyone who was kind of not sure what, what that meant or what the context behind that was. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to use this slide here to actually lead us kind of into the demo conversation. So, we're going to take a look at um, quite a few different things. I may have been logged out for security reasons. I may have to log myself back in, but that's not the end of the world. Um, but we're basically going to look at Salvation Army, the Western Region Network, um, and some of the things that Randy and, and his team have been doing with the technology. So, this is probably going to Log me out, sure enough. 
go ahead and sign back in. And one of the other real benefits that we saw from Meraki is that the HA availability that we've done uh, at our primary data centers and at all of our retail outlets. Um, and we can focus on one of those too as we go through this demo. But the ability to put um, two Amex devices in a failover mode and either and then to have a, a tertiary uh, 4G backup that's built right into the device. And I don't know how many of the, uh, the people on the call understand that uh, Meraki supports two or three uh, 4G uh, modem devices that if your primary internet connection fails, will switch over to 4G cellular to do their transactions. And I'll, I'll point out one that's actually in failover right now today so people can see that as well. Um, but uh, that's been um, one of the biggest points of contention with all re our retail stores is the ISP. In fact, I can tell from personal experiences, two days before Christmas, we lost two stores. And they did not have Meraki, and we had to P1 a Meraki device with a 4G modem out to that site to get them back up. And so that's, uh, with that technology and that ability built in, that's just been wonderful. Great. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the things we see a lot for these kind of widely distributed architectures, like what, what you have with Salvation Army. You know, when you have those sites that you don't necessarily have IT or you don't have a local depot nearby to go and get replacement hardware or whatever it is, that ability to just, um, especially if it's a location where it might be hard to get multiple broadband circuits, so it's hard to have, you know, that backup circuit in case the primary goes down, things like that in more remote regions, having that 3G, 4G capability is, is really, really helpful. Um, so what we're looking at here is actually the Salvation Army, what's called Organization Overview page. And there's a few things off screen. There's a few other in, up in Alaska and, and other things here. Um, looks like an Anchorage. But the majority of the sites for the Western region are located right here, right in the, on, along the West Coast and kind of the Southwest and a few up in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Colorado. Um, one thing you'll notice is that if I zoom out and zoom in, the number of those kind of markers on the map changes. Basically, as you zoom out, it'll start aggregating those. So each of these might represent multiple networks. So if we look at this one marker, it actually represents five different uh, sites. And we can dive into each of those sites from here, or we can zoom in and see kind of in more detail, start breaking those out a little bit, right? Um, we can also see the kind of stoplight traffic style of the color coding. So green means everything's good. Red means there might be some devices down, right? Yellow means there's some devices that are alerting, not necessarily down, but maybe a switch power supply is offline, or maybe there's an AP that's registering a lot of interference on all channels or things like that that you may want to know about. Um, aside from the map view, we also have this network's list, and this is literally exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of all the different networks, and in the context of Meraki, a network is a configuration container. Usually it's a site. Um, it depends on how you've structured your kind of dashboard account, but you have the organization, which is your whole account, and then you have the networks within that organization, which are the config containers that you put the devices in, right, the shells, if you will. Um, and you can have one network that contains multiple products, and that's what we'll look at here. But this is a list of all those networks. Uh, in the case of Salvation Army, these are all different sites, different locations. And you can see things like what's the total usage. We can sort by any of these columns as well. We can add and remove columns if we want to, to see different things. We can see, you know, how many clients. So let's see who has the most clients. It's HQ, not that surprising. Um, we can see whether it's a single type of device, just security appliances, just switches, just wireless, just MDM or if it's what's called a combined network. So the first one I wanted to look at, and, and Randy, I may kind of tag you in to point me to some uh, networks that have some cool features we can show off, but I wanted to show off the Cathedral City location because it's got a, a good spread of devices. So if I just click into that, and let me blow this up a little bit, I shrunk it to show the map more effectively. Um, we jump right into this Cathedral City location. You'll notice in this bar on the left, we've got our list and we, we can search. I'm from Santa Barbara, so it's easy for me to remember couple locations here in Santa Barbara, right, California. Um, you can jump around between these different sites very, very easily. And in each site, you actually have the different devices. So some might just have security. Some might just have wireless. In this particular location, we have security switching and wireless. So they're all shown here. And this is a huge part of that single pane of glass style um, that Randy was talking about. I know that term is very overused in the market, but it is really important to highlight that because 
with almost any other architecture, almost any other solution, you have a management console for your switching, you have a management console for your wireless, you have a management console for your security, you certainly have separate ones for things like video, voice over IP, MDM. Cisco Meraki is the only architecture, it's the only solution in the world that combines all of these different elements of IT into one management console where you can manage them all together. And we actually combine a lot of the data together so that you can see things like client data across wired and wireless. Right, so these clients, you can see some are wired, some are wireless. I can filter and just show wireless clients. I can just show wireless clients that are online right now uh, and maybe that are in you know, a particular subnet or are iPhones. Right, so it's very easy to filter this down and see what you wanna see. And you can also see things like usage. So what is the network being used for? Um, some Windows file sharing here, some Dropbox, and you can dive into something like iTunes one, you can up top see how much of your total bandwidth over the last day, week, month is actually, or, or even two hour period for that matter, um, is being used for that application. And you can dive into the application and see who all is using it, right? How much bandwidth is each individual client using for iTunes? Um, you can come at that from the other perspective and pull up a client. So if we go back to my wireless online filter and we pull up you know, this iPhone, right, we can kind of see information about that device, how it's connected, what wireless seems like. You do have the ability to turn on what's called detailed hosting visibility, which is not enabled here, probably for privacy reasons for the, you know, the guests and users, but you do have the ability to turn on a feature where you can actually see all the applications that individual user is using as well, and how much bandwidth, how much active time, things like that. Um, so from a, a Capabilities perspective, there's a couple things that I want to show, and feel free, Randy, to jump in if there's anything that you think you know we should dig into or that you uh, want me to, to take a look at. Um, but there's a couple key things that I think are worth looking at. One is the summary report. So the summary report is your top 10 list. It's kind of your at-a-glance view of what's happening with this network. And in this case, we're looking at things like who are the top clients using the most bandwidth, right? What are the applications using the most bandwidth? What's the history of the uplink health? So we have, in this case, just one internet uplink. You could have more. And we're showing over the last, you know, whatever period of time we've got here, in the last day, we could change this. Let's say, let's do last week. We just switch it over to last week. And we can see here clients per day, again, client usage. And we can see over the last week, you've had 0.05% loss, which is not bad at all for a broadband circuit, right? It's almost nothing. Our average latency has been about 13 milliseconds, 13 to 14 milliseconds. Again, not bad. And we can see jitter, we can see, you know, what's the total time this link has been up? 99.92% of the last week. So it's very easy to look at kind of health uh, and just basic metrics here. The other thing you can do with this is actually say, instead of this one network, let's look at all of our networks over the last week. And this is a ton of data, right? We're pulling together data for all these different locations. And over all those networks, you've got almost 30 terabytes of usage. 20 point, 21 point something down, about 8.5 up. And again, you've got all these metrics about who are the top consumers of bandwidth, both in terms of which network, in terms of which SSIDs, in terms of which you know clients, operating systems, which switches are using the most power, all these different pieces of data that help you to understand the context of what's happening globally with your network, right? Um, on the features and capabilities side, is where I really want to highlight how easy it is to do some of the things that Randy was talking about earlier. So when you look at something like uh, content filtering, right, you can create content filtering rules right here in dashboard. All you do is you go in and say, I want to block these categories. And it's a list of about 85 different categories. You can start typing here to, you know, add new categories. Um, oops, re-maximize that. Um, you can go in here and you can say that you want to block or whitelist individual URLs, and these kinds of policies are applicable to the whole network, the whole site. There are ways to make a content filtering policy only apply to certain groups of users, and we'll look at that in a second as well. You have things like layer three and layer seven firewall, which is pretty straightforward, I won't dive into that. Um, one of my favorite features, and the one that I know that Salvation Army uses, is auto VPN. So, Randy talked about DMVPN and sort of the way that, that that was being used in Salvation Army previous to this Meraki implementation. 
The cool thing about AutoVPN is that it's all cloud brokered. So when you go in and you say, I want this Cathedral City location to talk back to my, my colo, my headquarters, and say a regional HQ site or something similar, you just go and you say, I want it to be a VPN spoke. I want it to talk to these three. You can add more hubs if you want to, right? And you say, I want these subnets to communicate over the VPN. So maybe your guest subnet doesn't. No reason it should talk to the data center. Maybe your building system subnet doesn't, but your data and voice subnets do. And then you hit save, and that's it. That's the entire site-to-site -site VPN configuration. And when you do that, what's going to happen is the dashboard is going to send this config to not only this location, but all of the hubs that you've specified here, so they all know how to talk back to this site. And it's going to build IPsec tunnels automatically for you. If anything changes, if the IP of a site changes, if an Internet link fails over, if any of those kinds of things happen, it'll automatically just the cloud will know, oh, this site's IP has changed. It'll relay that information to the peers, and they'll just rebuild that tunnel. So AutoVPN is personally I think my favorite feature on the security appliance because it makes something that can be a real hassle, especially at scale, really, really easy. Um, if there's anything you want to add, Randy, about your experience with, with AutoVPN, feel free to jump in there. No, that's been a big, uh, a big, uh, a big boon for us to be able to create those automatically and set up the, the hubs and the spokes and just add clients or delete clients very quickly and very easily. And the other thing I don't think you mentioned is when we have to replace a device, which occurs occasionally, is basically you tell it, hey, this device is going back here to Cathedral City, and it gets all of Cathedral City's information and subnets and all that stuff just automatically built back to it. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So to, to show uh, kind of what Randy was just talking about, if you have a device that you need to pull out and replace, right, you need to do a cold swap, you literally go in here to the, what's called the appliance status page. You click remove from network, and then all the configuration is, is maintained. This network still stays there. This device just is unassociated from that network. You can then go in and add a different device in that will inherit all those same settings, that same configuration automatically. Um, those VPN tunnels, once you have them up, you can obviously monitor. You can see how much bandwidth is being used between the different locations. You can see latency, things like that. The other thing I wanted to highlight on the uh, wired side is the switching. So switching, there's, there's one really cool thing. There's a lot of cool features of our switches, but there's one that I really want to show off here, and that is what's called the virtual stack. So we have these three switches here, and we can dive into any one switch, and we can see you know, bright green is uh, gig, this kind of slightly dimmer green or darker green is a 100 meg port, and you can see that down here, auto negotiate, 100 meg. You can see some information about the different you know, the switch itself, the different ports, PoE power, what's connected to it. So there's a Cisco IP phone plugged into this port. You can do a cable test to check the twisted pairs on the cable. You can cycle the port, do the equivalent of a shut, no shut on that port, right, all from dashboard. And you can look at things like I want to run a ping or a trace route or reboot the device or run some troubleshooting tools, do a packet capture, right? All these things can be done natively from the dashboard. But the other thing that you can do is you can manage all of your switches basically as one switch, and that's what we call the virtual stack. So physical stacking is also supported on uh, most of the modern Meraki switches, but you can get the management value of stacking without having to physically stack your switches. So even if these switches aren't you know, stacked or they're in different closets across a campus or whatever it is, you'll notice when I go to switch ports, I have my three different switches all right in here. So if I want to make a change, on port five of every of each switch, very, very easy to do. If I want to make a change to every single port that's got a VoIP phone plugged into it, oops, typo there. Great. I can do this by LDP, a discovery, neighbor discovery protocol, right? Similar to CDP on Cisco on kind of the, the in the Cisco common infrastructure. LDP is just the non-Cisco specific version of that. So these are all the ports that have a device attached to them that has SEP in the LLDP string, and that's what identifies a Cisco phone. So if I want to go in and say every port that's got a Cisco phone on it, I'm going to go ahead and change my voice VLAN, because I'm changing my voice VLAN across the whole infrastructure, right? It'll change all 19 of those ports up to 200 ports at a time across up to 200 switches at a time. So it's incredibly, incredibly easy to make changes to you know, a range of ports within a switch, to ports across multiple switches, define the ports that you want to change. Um, finally, on the, on the wireless side, 
there's a lot of cool stuff there as well. So if we look at Salvation Army, there are two SSIDs on the wireless. There's internal and external. And a you know, corporate, corporate and guest, right? So the internal is set up with radius, whereas the external is set up with just a password. So you can get your guest, they can connect. And you can set up up to 15 SSIDs on any given Meraki access point. You can scope these SSIDs to only be brought broadcast from certain APs, but you can also go in and say, okay, let's go ahead and go in and change some of the settings of this ID. So here we've got, again, that radius WPA2 enterprise. We've got the option for a built-in splash page or to integrate with a third-party splash page, something that Randy mentioned earlier. You can use ICE or Systems Manager, our MDM, to authenticate these devices to the wireless. You can change how clients are actually connected. Are they bridged straight onto the network? Are they isolated in what's called a NAT mode SID, where they're not part of the corporate network, they're completely separate from it, separate IP scheme, they're under a NAT layer, they get their IP directly from the access point, they can't talk to other clients, right? So you have a lot of control over kind of what the wireless operation looks like all right here in dashboard. And then you can also do firewalling and traffic shaping directly on the access points. So it doesn't look like this particular site is using any traffic shaping, but if we wanted to, we just go to shape traffic. We add something to let's say, you know, control how much BitTorrent traffic or how much Gmail traffic, Hulu traffic, whatever it may be, can be used on this network. And we just say, okay, I only want, and I'm gonna click details here to split this out into up down, 512 down, 256 up, right? For that type of traffic. And you can add multiple traffic types here as well. You can also set uh, prioritization and, and DCP, DSCP quality of service rules. So that capability to be able to go in in the client's view and see, okay, what applications are taking up a bunch of traffic, a bunch of bandwidth, and then go in and just make those changes here. From a monitoring perspective, um, you want to be able to do things like troubleshoot the access points, right? So you go in and you say, okay, what does our RF environment look like? If we're having people complain of issues with connecting to the wireless, well, here are the different APs and here's their wireless environment. So this particular AP has high interference on 2.4 gig. And if we pull this up, we're actually gonna see a spectrum graph view of point in time on top and a three minute time lapse on the bottom. And this will show us that there are sources of interference that are appearing and disappearing over time on certain channels. So if we wanna see, you know, is that microwave over there creating interference? Unplug it, watch this for a couple seconds and see if one of those yellow or red areas cools to blue if you plug something in and blue goes to yellow or red, obviously you've introduced a source of interference and you can see what APs out there are interfering with the ARF environment. Finally, on the wireless side, you also have one of my favorite new capabilities is something we just added. You can go in and look at what's called an RF troubleshooting page. And this is gonna show you, I'm trying to find a way to get all this in one screen without making it too small to see because um, my, my laptop here doesn't have the biggest monitor in the world, biggest screen in the world. I can look over time at all the different RF information and events. So I can click here and see there was an RF channel change. If you look here on the right, at this time, we can see there was one active client, how much channel utilization, right? How much of that was added to 11 wireless traffic versus other sources of interference, five gig channel utilization, total usage, like bandwidth usage. So I can see all of this together in context help me identify what might have caused an issue that someone reported. I mentioned earlier that you can create content filtering policies at the network level, but you can also create them for certain groups of clients. So this is the last thing I'm gonna show in the demo, um, unless Randy has anything else he wants me to specifically call out. But you can go in here and create what are called um, group policies. And group policies are just a set of different policies that you're only gonna to apply to a certain group of users. So you might create an application firewall rule to block ESPN. I'm not sure why you would, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, you create a traffic shaping rule. You could turn on advanced malware protection. Cisco's AMP functionality to prevent against malware. You could turn on content filtering or have different content filtering rules. You can schedule these policies for certain times of day, certain days of the week. You can change your firewall rules, change your traffic shaping rules. All these things can be put in these policies and these policies can be applied to an active directory group to clients directly in dashboard. They can be applied by device type on the wireless. They can be applied using systems manager for posture, for MDM. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. You can also apply them to VLANs. Makes it very, very easy to ensure that each client is getting the policy they're supposed to get. 
So, Randy, unless there's anything else you want me to highlight, I'm going to jump back into slides. Any any thoughts? You know, I uh, it might be worth pulling up uh, Denver uh, 18, um, or no, Phoenix 18. Uh, if you oh. can type in Phoenix 18. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> and um, this is one of our retail outlets. And if you go to the appliance status, you'll notice it's um, it says there's a problem here. It says DNS is misconfigured, but you'll also notice that it's uh, it's on 4G. It's running on 4G right now, and has been since February 28th. Um, one of the administrative uh, assistants canceled their internet, uh, and so it's been it's been running basically on 4G for almost a month now. And so we've been trying to get that internet reestablished, but the, the store has absolutely no knowledge of that. All the transactions are operating just flawlessly. So that's a beautiful thing. There's another one that's, I think, like I said, uh, the failover, I think, was Phoenix uh, 18 is set up for failover. We've got two, uh, one in HA and one not in HA, or one live and one uh, end. So uh, that would be another one just to kind of pull up so people can see uh, what that, that failover kind of looks like or what that HA pair looks like. Denver 19? Yeah, Denver. I'm sorry, Denver 19. Oh, no problem. Denver Thankfully, 19. it's nice and easy for me to jump between these. Yeah. Sorry, I've got some kind of weird browser thing happening here, so I apologize for the red banner on top there. Um, there we go. So, yeah, this one's in an HA pair. We have cellular sitting ready if we need to fail over to it. It's not currently active. And then right. we have a spare device here that's passive. It's the, the warm spare. In case the primary MX fails, the warm spare will just take over. Correct. Great. All right, well, with that, let me jump back into the slides for just a minute, and then we'll take some questions. Um, and we'll we'll keep an eye on the Q&A panel and the webinar for those questions. So if you have any questions that are springing to mind, please feel free to throw those in. Um, the last thing I really want to talk about before we answer a few questions and give you some next steps is the Meraki full stack. So the full stack is the term that we use to refer to kind of this broad range of Meraki solutions in the portfolio. We've talked about MR, MX, and MS a little bit today. We talked about systems manager a little bit. We talked about security cameras a little bit. So hopefully, you know, everyone got a, at least some picture of those. Um, we didn't get too deep into systems manager or MV. Um, so that's some place that if you're curious, there's a lot more information available. We didn't really talk at all about MC. So that's the one that I'm going to mention here, IP telephony, IP phones. Um, so that's another product that we offer. The thing to keep in mind is, again, all of these are managed in one single pane of glass, in one dashboard across all these different layers of IT, whether you have one site or a thousand sites, you manage all these different things in one place. And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful from an efficiency and cost savings perspective, from a sanity perspective, right? No more router parties. Um, the ability to deliver, you know, cloud updates, cloud features, deliver firmware updates, all these devices natively from the cloud just takes a lot of the hassle out of the IT management experience. So what's next? Well. First of all, if you want to try any of these products, you can go to meraki.cisco.com slash eval. You can try any Meraki product for free. Um, you can also check out our blog, meraki.cisco.com slash blog, to learn more about kind of what's going on with Meraki, our products, our features, our company in general, right, our business unit within Cisco, and your best resource for all things Meraki. So if, we have, if you have a question we don't get to today, which, again, is possible. There's so many folks on the line. Um, meraki.cisco.com slash contact. We'll give you the contact form. Or again, you can go into your webinar reminder email and you should have Meraki rep contact info in there. So any follow-up questions you have, anything you want to check into, if you want to get in touch and get that free AP, right, any of that, make sure you reach out to your rep. They're your best resource for all things Cisco Meraki. There are also a whole series of other webinars if you want to learn more about any of the particular products we talked about today. So if you, or if you want to learn about how these products might apply to your vertical, if you work in retail, if you work in healthcare, um, we do some of those type of webinars as well. So with that, Let's see what kind of questions we have. And there are probably going to be some questions for me and some questions for Randy. So that's what I usually run into. So let me see what I can find here. I'll expand my Q&A window out. Uh, all right. Um, so James wants to know, for the cellular connectivity, can you change the cell provider by just changing the SIM, or do you need to buy the device knowing the provider ahead of time? We are provider agnostic. Um, basically, we have to be able to talk to the cellular modem, the USB modem. So it needs to be a modem that we can support. But as long as that modem supports whatever carrier you're trying to put in it, we don't, we don't care. 
whatever carrier you want. We just need the modem to be one that we support. Um, Peter wants to know, does the Meraki mobile app have the same functionality as the web portal? It doesn't. The mobile app, so for those of you who don't know, there's a Cisco Meraki Android and, I, uh, and iOS app that you can actually use to manage from an iPad, iPhone, Android device, um, and it's really primarily used for monitoring. So it's not designed to let you go in and make configuration changes. It's designed to help you monitor the network on the go. So it does not have all the configuration functionality, but it has a lot of the monitoring and visibility. Sam asked if all of our MXs have 4G failover support. Yes, every model supports 4G um, with the USB modem. It's not native. It's not internal 4G. Let's see here. Um, Patricia wants to know how long the free evaluations are. Uh, it depends on, generally, I believe it's two weeks, but we can, in some cases, extend them depending on what you need to do. We, we recognize that, you know, two weeks may not be long enough to deploy in a test environment and test all the things you want to test, so just work with your rep on that. Paul says the one big piece of pushback that he gets for deploying Meraki is whether it's kind of enterprise ready in terms of scaling and size. So what, what documentation or what case studies do we have or what can we do to kind of address that? Well, I can tell you off the top of my head, I can think of six different Meraki customers, and these are just the ones I can think of right now, who have over 10,000 locations being managed through, through a Meraki architecture. Some of them are just security, some are security switch wireless, some are just wireless. Um, we also have, you know, customers who are using this to manage large campuses. So pretty much any size, whether it's vertical sizing in terms of the size of a site or horizontal sizing in terms of the number of sites, we can support. We have, you know, customers that are doing that today. Um, we can certainly talk to your rep and ask about references or case studies that might be able to help you kind of get through that objection. Uh, Raphael mentions that he doesn't believe he got a webinar reminder email, so he's not sure who his rep is. Again, if you don't know who your rep is and you don't see that email, go to meraki.cisco.com slash contact, and you'll be able to fill out a form and your rep will reach out to you. Joshua has a question on the cameras. If you lose connectivity with the cameras, internet connectivity, where do the images get stored? So the cameras are kind of unique, and I won't dive into this too much because we don't really have time, um, but the cameras actually, all the video storage is local on the camera. It's not in the cloud. So you actually, losing internet connectivity doesn't do anything in terms of, you can still totally record all the video you want because we record it locally on the camera in solid state storage that's built into the cameras themselves. You just won't be able to go in and look at the video in dashboard until internet connectivity is restored, but we'll keep recording. Um, David Adler wants to know if Meraki is FedRAMP certified. No. Uh, we have no short-term plans for FedRAMP. My personal opinion on this, not speaking as a representative of Meraki, just speaking as an IT guy, um, because I, I am an IT guy by background, is that the FedRAMP certification has not really caught up to this kind of cloud technology evolution. So I think it's going to be a little bit yet before we get to a point where we feel that it's worth the investment of getting FedRAMP certified because right now there are so many elements of FedRAMP that just don't really make sense with the way that cloud technologies work. Um, Ole or Ole, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that name right, wants to know if we support CradlePoint for 4G to Ethernet. We absolutely do. We have a lot of customers doing that today. Um, Chris is asking about the Systems Manager MDM. Is it included in the cost of service or is it an add-on? It's a separate product. So Systems Manager is its own product. Uh, it is independent. It works with and is managed in the same dashboard as the hardware products, but it's a separate product that you purchase mm -hmm. independently and can be used with Meraki technology, or you can just have Systems Manager and not use any of the Meraki hardware at all. Uh, Rick has a question on IPv6 support. Um, we do plan to support IPv6. I do not have a date for you for full IPv6 support, but it is something that's being worked on. Sorry, I got a lot of questions and I'm trying to get through as many as I can. I can probably do two more and then we'll have to call it. Um, so we've got, UD wants to know if we can support deployments in China and Dubai. Yes, we do have customers deploying in those locations today. So you can use Meraki devices. They will be able to talk to the cloud uh, in both China and Dubai. I actually was in Shanghai uh, a few months ago, uh, traveling with my wife pulled out my Meraki MX uh, that I use when I travel. My, my device that I kind of use is my hotel teleworker device, and it connected right up to the cloud. Everything worked just fine. 
EMM licenses are per device, so the number of devices you're managing is how the pricing works. Uh, and then the final question, because I, I am unfortunately out of time, question on is the subscription service, is the cloud management service subscription required for all the functionality that was demoed? You have to have a cloud subscription, a cloud license to operate Meraki devices, period. So you, you cannot use these devices without a license. That being said, you have the option to either purchase in a subscription model where you do one or three years of licensing and then you renew, or we do offer up to 10 year licenses. So what some organizations will do if they don't like that subscription style is they'll do a seven or a 10 year license up front, which is actually cheaper per year because the longer term license you buy, the cheaper it is per year. Um, and they'll just make that a one-time cost because at the end of that seven or 10 year period, they're gonna replace the hardware anyway. So I apologize. Um, so, sorry, one more that I saw that I want to make sure I answer. Uh, Meraki.cisco.com slash email, not Meraki-cisco.com, because I see one person saying they're not able to access it. And I think that Eva might have the URL wrong there. Um, so I apologize. I don't have time to answer any more questions, but please do reach out to your rep with any questions you have. Um, hopefully you've got some good information today. Thank you again so much, Randy, for joining us. Very, very helpful. Glad to have you here. You bet. Um, and thanks to everyone else who joined us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week, and um, hope you learned some good stuff today about Meraki and then what Salvation Army is doing with it. So thanks again, and I will hopefully talk to you all soon in one form or another.